tell you, I tell you, tell you how I love you. Yes, I do. And welcome to the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church of the Shrines of the Black Madonna's weekly stream broadcast. I'm Pastor Mbaye Chui from the Mother Shrine here in Detroit. And on behalf of our virtual village, which includes Detroit, Atlanta, Houston, Beulah Land at Calhoun Falls, South Carolina, and Monrovia and Gansa City, Liberia, West Africa, we appreciate you joining us. And we ask that you don't forget to donate, like, comment and share all of our online content with other like-minded souls in order to help us build a united Pan-African world community. Asante Sana, we're glad you're here. Our goal is to be the church of the future. The 21st century mystery temple. A place where the church is a tool for human development, human growth and evolution, the recovery of black people's humanity and dignity, and a power center for black self-determination. We're doing it in every city that we're in, and we're gonna do it in every city we wanna to go to in order to facilitate the consciousness raising of black people. Our goal, simply said, is to restore our people to our original place of power and dignity in the world. Amen. Greetings, brothers and sisters. I'm Reverend Amban Dwile, an associate pastor at Shrine Number no. 1 in Detroit, Michigan. And on behalf of our congregation, Shrine Number no. 9 in Atlanta, Georgia, Shrine 10 in Houston, Texas, Calhoun Falls, South Carolina, where our Beulah Land Farms are located, and Liberia, Africa. Uh, we want to welcome you to today's Festival of Life. We also like to extend a welcome to all those throughout the diaspora who may be spending some time with us this morning. We don't take for granted that you could be doing something else this morning, but you've decided to spend a little time with us. So kick back, put your feet up, and get your praise on. And we thank God for allowing you to be with us this morning. As we prepare our mind, body, spirits for today's Karamu Festival, let us avail ourselves to the awesome power of God that offers itself to us through the mysteries of the universe. We've been blessed with the wisdom of the ancestors that teach us that as long as we are in like minds and with unified hearts and have untethered spirits, no obstacle is too great for us to overcome. Let us agree and be determined in our effort to be agents of change that God requires of each of us 
to be in the world today. Again, welcome to all of you who have joined us this morning. And we want you to sit back, relax, take your time. We hope that your time with us is uplifting and encouraging. Please assume an attitude and a posture of prayer as we pray a prayer of invocation. Almighty God, we quiet our minds, we still our bodies, and we open our spirits to your presence in unwavering love. Help us to see with our mind's eye your divine mandate for our lives and the world in which we live. Allow this celebration of life through and with you to grant the needed self to heal any and all wounded spirits. O oh, cosmic creator, we hope this worship experience exalts your majestic presence in our lives. And we pray our attention to your will and way empowers us to be more Christ-like upon our earthly journey. O oh, God of our ancestors, we know there is none like you. And we pray that you would tarry a while with us this day. Be in our intent, be in the message, be a fence around us every day. We cast this prayer along the unified energy vibration and trust you have heard or hear our plea. We let go and pray our expressions of praise and worship. Lift your glorious virtues to life. We pray this in all prayers in the name of our standard bearer and revolutionary example, Jesus, the Black Messiah. Ashe and Amen. something to it. Just to encourage you. We're going to take you to church later. Let's go! We'll keep marching right until the victory is won. To all my brothers out there. Hold your head up, brothers, till the victory is won. To all my sisters in the struggle. Keep believing, sister, till the victory is won. Till that day. Till that day comes. Hey! Let us march on. To victory. Till victory.
Family, we're living in turbulent times. We're in the grips of a pandemic that has disrupted our lives. It has upended our routines and rearranged our schedules. Caught in the middle of this health crisis is a generation forced to juggle their aspirations, education, and careers with the uncertainty of where to go next and led by incapable leadership. Our pastoral prayer is for those caught in limbo, held hostage by political pundits and unqualified policymakers. We pray for this year's group of scholars, this new generation of students who would be ordinarily preparing to move forward in their quest for higher learning and education, but have been sidetracked by a bigger plan and unfortunately by human inadequacy. They're stuck by others' short-sightedness and lack of leadership. If you would, pray with me. O oh, divine waymaker, the world is in a dark place without you. Without you, it's a world lacking appreciation for life, a life that requires communal commitment and responsibility. We come now to pray for those caught in the snares of a divided and individualistic world. We pray for tomorrow's leaders and future decision makers, those perceived to be voiceless and those teething on making life's difficult and hard choices. We forget they are the ones who will inherit our lack of action and indecisiveness. So we pray for a new year of learning, a new class of scholars. We pray for compassion into a new frontier of the educational process. O God of my art, govern the spheres of influence that watch over this year's crop of eager mind, body, spirits. At a time when most institutions of higher learning would be preparing to receive students, they first must determine how to best provide a safe space for learning. We pray they call upon you in their deliberation, O oh God. We pray for your insight during their moments of consternation. We pray for your courage to follow for your just and righteous path of safe, productive, healthy path forward. We pray for your guidance in the lives of parents, teachers, and community. We pray for the administrators. We pray during this most challenging time, O oh God, that you show up and show out. Cover the tempted, shelter the innocent, shine through the darkness of despair and fear that prevent grown folk from making just and right decisions. Protect the coming and going of our children as they venture into a world of new norms and ever-changing realities. We trust this petition finds a way to your receptive ears, and we thank you in advance for your attention to our mundane affairs. We ask this in all prayers in the name of our Christ standard bearer, the Black Messiah Jesus. Ashe, and let the faithful say, Amen. Well, I believe in the power of raising my voice, and I believe in the power of making some noise. Now, if I die, I can't sing, and if I can't sing, I die. So we can sing with one another. Now, let's give it a try. Well, I, I am going to sing now. I'm going to march on. 
you've been a mother to me. If 400 million Negroes can only get to know themselves, to know that in them is a sovereign power, is an authority that is absolute, and then in the next 24 hours, we will have a new race, we will have a nation, an empire resurrected, not from the will of others to see us rise, but from our own determination to rise, irrespective of what the world thinks. You see, brothers and sisters, we are in week three of our month-long celebration of the life and legacy of the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey. We acknowledge his impact on our church, and we appreciate his, his, his raising the level of consciousness and activism of black people everywhere. In week one, Reverend Kalonji delivered a powerful message, Liberated Potential. And last week in his inspiring message titled Caught Up in the Spirit, Bishop Mwenda helped us to understand the church's mission and its connection to the Garvey movement, an effort to build a powerful pan-African world community.
This week, we're going to focus our attention on the power of knowing thyself. What does it mean to know thyself? Let us now turn our attention to the scripture uh, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 8, and it reads, The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is deceit. The book of Proverbs, according to biblical scholars, is, is largely linked to King Solomon, who during his rule was in pursuit of greater wisdom and understanding of the world. He looked to tap into wisdom and use it to make good decisions and establish a moral law that is grounded in both spirituality and in faith. The African nation Israel saw wisdom as an attribute of God, and because of their fear of God, and we're not talking about fear in the sense of terror, but fear in the sense of a healthy reverence for God. It was because of their fear of God that they sought to understand God's definition of good and evil. So the book of Proverbs is a result of a collection of, of sayings intended to bring about greater wisdom. And when we talk about wisdom, we're not talking about wisdom simply for the purposes of intellectual stimulation, but for the purposes of good, putting God's moral laws in to action. And so because Proverbs consist of these clever little statements, it requires for us, it requires us to unpack the scripture this morning. And you say, you know, new preacher man, before you unpack this scripture, can, can you put the lang put it in more of a digestible language, put it in something that we can put it in a way that we can understand it and know what it is you're unpacking. And so if I were a baby boomer and I were rewriting this scripture, I would say, y'all better keep it tight and to the right. Otherwise, they'll run con game on you. Being a Generation X, I, might, I would say, keep it real or you'll get game. Now, if I were a millennial, I might write the verse to say, keep it 100. Otherwise, you'll get got or they'll run or you'll fall prey to the alternative facts and fake news. But we stand here today as black Christian nationalists, and so we interpret the scripture from this vantage point. Every child born to a black Madonna is a new black Messiah, only waiting to discover their inner divinity. And on the flip side of that scripture, we, we would put it this way. We would say, otherwise, you're accepting the false declaration of black inferiority. And so today, as we explore this subject, we will explore it this way. When they define us versus when we define us. Now you ask, well, who is the they and what power do they think they have to define us? Andrew Hacker in his book, Two Nations, offers an explanation of the power structure that exists here in America that would have them believe that they have the power to define us. He writes, America is inherently a white country in character and structure and culture. Needless to say, black Americans create their own lives, yet as a people, they face boundaries and constrictions that are set by the white majority. America's version of apartheid, while lacking overt legal sanction, comes closest to this system even now, reformed in a land of its invention. Our founder, Jermoji Bebe Ajman, understood that there were, was two existences and there continues to be two existences within one country. He understood this more than 66 years ago when he said to a reporter, I didn't create these separate systems, you did. We look to build a nation within a nation because the basic issue for us is self-determination. We want to control our own destiny. They think they have the power to define us because they established these two separate systems. The deceivers, as the scripture would refer to them, look to define the revolutionary black Messiah Jesus as a white Jesus only to promote white supremacy. Thus trying to have us follow the false logic of if God is white and our oppressor is white, then our oppression must be all right. This, con this conditioning continues to this day. From the day that we walk into school to graduation day, Holton Mifflin, the major publisher of textbooks, has fed our, our children lies. They would have us believe that the villains that initiated our oppression, 
are our great heroes. And as they force feed us these lies, they offer very little history of our glorious past when they see us. Well, I can spend a whole lot of time enumerating the countless examples of, of the who, what, when, where, why, and how they want to define us. It is important that we stay squarely focused on what Marcus Garvey is teaching us. He said in that quote, we would have a new nation, an empire, resurrected, let's listen closely, not from the will of others to see us rise, but from our own determination to rise, irrespective of what others think. It's easy for us to talk about the system or a group of people that are keeping us down. It's easy for us to talk about structural racism. We know what it looks like when we see systemic or institutional racism. That's easy. We know that they've tried, they have blatantly used language in the past to define us. Then they transition to a more subtle whistle, dog whistle politics. And now they feel comfortable under the Trump regime to be as bold in their racism as they always wanted to be. You see, it's easy for us to call it out, but it's hard to dig into and unpack the subject of the unconscious acceptance of someone else's view of you. Someone who seeks to deceive you. Someone who seeks to profit off of you. Someone who seeks to oppress you for their gain. The danger in accepting someone else's view of you is that you become whoever and whatever they say you are. You become their stereotype. The overly sexualized woman, the prince, the prostitutes, the drug dealers, the street hustlers, the absent fathers, the uneducated, and even the killers. In her 2019 miniseries, When They See Us, Ava DuVernay wrestles with what it means to be black and male in America. As much as this series was about the exoneration of five intentionally and wrongfully accused, pursued, and convicted black brothers, it was also about a criminal justice system that intentionally and willfully and happily lock up black males. Much of this was made possible through the images that were presented in the media. We were demonized over the years. We have watched popular television shows such as Cops and the First 48 and even our local news. All these television programs depict black men in a negative light. And so after years of seeing these images and, 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 and the world then being introduced to what was then known as the Central Park Five, what did the world say? Most importantly, what did we see? What did we say? Many of us said, you know what? They look like they did it. We were conditioned by our deceivers to believe that they look like they did it. When they see us, when we see us. The scripture tells us that the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. It is to know and define thyself. The beautiful thing, brothers and sisters, is that we don't have to look far to discover who we are. Our history is hiding in plain sight. Just open up the very first book of the good book, the Holy Bible, and you will find mention of the blue now. The Blue Nile flows from Ethiopia to Sudan. It is the birthplace of all life and all resources that preserve life. Science and the Bible are in agreement on this subject as the first black man was discovered in Africa. The first man was an African man. And the Bible tells us that on the sixth day, God created man and woman in his own image. And he stepped back and looked at all that he created and he said, that is very good. You see, God was pleased with what he had created. He was proud of the original. He was happy that he had had a blueprint for what was to follow. He was excited about his archetype. Stop allowing others to define you. God made you the prototype and not their stereotype. Africa is where Europeans travel to learn about science, mathematics, and philosophy. And even with the stolen knowledge and the current technologies that engineers have, they continue to discover new mysteries of the pyramid. But they still cannot figure out how ancient Egyptians constructed those pyramids. Here we are 4,500 years later. 
And the pyramids are considered one of the most daring and innovative projects the world has ever seen. We continue to be the prototype. And for those of you who think that Egypt is in the Middle East, I say again, don't accept other people's story. You better get to know your story. Your story says that the Christian tradition was not forced upon us by the oppressor. It was not introduced to us at the start of the pandemic known as COVID-1619. We accepted Jesus as our black Messiah, as our standard bearer more than 10 generations before Europeans fully co-opted and corrupted it. Ethiopians were followers of Christ before white men had refashioned the Messiah in an image that suited their desires. It is important for us to be clear about who we are as our survival depends on us telling our story. It is dependent upon us defining ourselves and it is not to be filtered by anyone else. We are bold, we are unapologetic and proud about who we are and where we come from. As much as Black Lives Matter, the words we use to define ourselves also matter. We are not descendants of slaves. We are descendants of survival, survivors. We not only withstood the greatest atrocity in human history, we stand strong today, 400 million strong. We must stop accepting other people's narratives. In a bit less, in 80 days, we have an important election. And as we say every election year, this is the most important election in our lives. And as much as that might sound cliche, I must restate, this is the most important election in our lives. You see, last election cycle, we were deceived. We thought when Trump said, just grab a woman by her private parts, that he would lose the white evangelical votes. We thought that he would especially lose white women. We thought because he was so arrogant as a billionaire, he would turn off poor and middle-class white voters. And then we were confused. We were confounded. We were baffled when he won. We asked the question, how could they vote against their own interests. Well, in, their, in her book, Cast, The Lies That Divide Us, writer Isabel Wilkerson wrestles with this. She examines three of the world's most rigid, rigid caste systems, Nazi Germany, India, and the good old US of A. And she offers a different perspective with respect to the election. She suggests that white people who voted for Trump were in fact voting in their own interests. You see, as the demographics of this country are rapidly changing, whereby the United States is becoming a more colorful place, white folks are feeling like their power is slipping away. Wilkerson suggests that their support for Trump is an effort to maintain the racial caste system that exists and it exists to their benefits. You see, in their own mind, for as long as that system exists, they at least have a shot. They believe maintaining the system was more important than their religious interests. It was more important than their moral righteousness. It was even more important than their financial well-being. You see, in 2016, they were voting in their own interest. They were voting to hold on to a system that was built by them, for them, and that was paramount. It trumped all other issues. You see, in this election cycle, the deceivers have already started to try to create an, a, narr a narrative around Democratic nominee for Vice President Kamala Harris, a sister born in Oakland, California, graduated from Howard University, earned her law degree at Cal California University, a U.S. Senator. She is representative of the most educated demographic, the most undercompensated demographic, the most underappreciated demographic, yet she still wakes up every morning with a fighting spirit for her people. They will try to say choosing an African-American woman is a token gesture, a knee-jerk reaction to the response of the police murdering of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And by the way, the murderers of Breonna Taylor are still at, lar at large. They will try to paint the senator as an angry black woman. They will try to appeal to the deeply rooted 
white power, chauvinistic seeds that exist, they will ask the question, do you really want her to replace Biden if he's unable to serve as president? She has them running scared, brothers and sisters. They decide to pull out all the stops. Trump has already called her nasty. He's already made these subtle digs, well, shall I say not so subtle digs, by pulling the race card stating that, I'm not so sure the suburban white women will vote for Senator Harris. They are trying to breathe new life into the Trump up birther movement. And they're even trying to cripple the post office to suppress votes. You see, they will also look for us to tear us down, tear her down. You know, we, she ain't black enough. She ain't, ain't, ain't dark enough. She ain't progressive enough. Well, let's not play into their hands, brothers and sisters. Yes, she will have to address her record on criminal justice. But I will say that he has a reason to be scared. So let's talk about how she prosecuted Donald Trump's appointments during the confirmation hearings. Let's talk about during the Senate hearings, how she aggressively went after Attorney General William Barr. She questioned him to a point where he tapped out under the pressure. And I can't wait to litigate for her to litigate her case before the American people and go after 45 and Mike Pence's policies. You see, brothers and sisters, we cannot leave anything to chance in this election cycle. We must create a new narrative during this cycle and transform our thinking politically. It's time for us to establish a black agenda for America and galvanize 44 million Africans here in America around the issues that are important to our community and then force the establishment to respond to us. If 400 million Negroes can only get to know themselves, to know that in them is a sovereign power, is an authority that is absolute, then in the next 24 hours, we will have a new race, a new nation, an empire resurrected, not from the will of others to see us rise, but from our own determination to rise, irrespective of what the world thinks. Know thyself and be active participants in the rebuilding of our community and a black nation. Know thyself and let's restructure a curriculum that tells our story to our children. Know thyself and know that our people can take control of the natural resources of the motherland and the timber, the diamonds, the iron ore, and the gold. Let's get rid of the neo-colonial structures that exist to suppress our social, political, and economic advancements in the motherland. Know thyself and reclaim our Christian religion and follow in the footsteps of the revolutionary black Messiah. For God gave us a song that black people forever shall sing. So we reject the beautiful yet deceiving songs that have been given to us by the white slave masters. A song that will have you sleep through and perpetuate your own oppression. Know the, you know what song I'm talking about. I'm talking about the song that says, I'm going up yonder. Let's reject that song and sing the song sang by Brother Syke. Sing the song sang by Olawanza. Sing the song sang by Reverend Cheo and Marcus Garvey and Jermoji Bebe Ajaman. It won't matter how they try to define us when 400 million of us wake up and know thyselves. We will rebuild a black nation, black and strong. That is not the lyrics that I'm talking about, yet that is one song. The other song that I'm speaking to, we've given a P. Diddy style remix. We've reimagined the version of I'm Going Up Yonder. That song sounds a bit like this. Now I can't sing it, but what I will do is ring it. If you wanna know, where I'm going, where I'm going soon. I'm going to the motherland. I'm going to al -Kibu land. I'm going to the motherland to be free once again. Amen and ashe. Amen, amen. Thank you so much for that powerful sermon. It's always amazing to be able to hear a word from God into what we should be doing today. As we know here and what we believe in the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church, we are about building things, building programs, and putting what God wants us to do in this world into action. And that takes resources and it takes giving. And so I'm asking you to think about what it is that you can do to help make our programs a reality. 
And during the month of August, we think about Marcus Garvey and specifically what it means to build a Pan-African world. We have so much that we're doing right here in this country, in Atlanta, in Beulah Land, in Detroit, in Houston. And I want you to give there, but I also want you to particularly think about giving to our churches in Liberia and building the Pan-African world that we know we can build. Thank you so much. Brothers and sisters, we come now to the time where we act upon our practice of self-determination, which sustains the many institutions of the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church. The Shrines of Detroit, Atlanta, Houston, our cultural centers, the Beulah Land Farms Incorporated, PAOCC Liberia, all were built upon the sacrificial giving that makes cooperative economics more than just an ideal, but a dream realized. Your financial support helps to keep our ministries in every region of the country relevant, transforming, and productive. As you donate today, make your tax-deductible donation by credit, debit, PayPal, direct deposit, or by check to the P.O. Box of your local region. Thank you for your sacrificial giving, which reflects the self-giving of our standard bearer, Jesus the Black Messiah. May God bless you for your tithing gift today, and we thank you for your continued support. Greetings. Welcome to Community News Across the Nation. If you're interested in doing your part in the liberation struggle of Black people, then get involved and join our Best Self Movement. Visit our website, shrineoftheblackmadonna.org, and hit the Join button. Visit, like, and follow the Facebook pages and social media handles of the Shrine Cultural Centers and Shrines of the Black Madonna of the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church. You'll find current events and relevant information. We invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Shrine Online, by giving it a thumbs up. Let's stay connected. The Shrines have always existed to serve our communities. In Detroit, the Mother Shrine, the food pantry, is held every third Wednesday and every third Saturday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Location, 7625 Linwood Street. In Houston, the Community Free Food Giveaway is held every Saturday from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. On August 18th in Atlanta, the food pantry, From My Hands to Yours, is having a food drive to give away produce from 2 p.m. until it's gone. Also in Atlanta, there will be a free COVID-19 testing site, August 21st, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. This will be a shallow nasal testing, 500 tests will be available with results in two to five days. The Buy Black Marketplace is back in Houston every Saturday in August, 12 noon to 6 p.m. Seven years of cooperative economics in action. Stuck inside during COVID, Houston presents Drive-In Movies at Sunset every Saturday in August. Volunteers are welcome for all Shrine events. Please share the information. Immediately following our service today, all regions tune in to our virtual coffee hour. We will have a special word from Jeremoji Kimafi on August 30th during our worship service. August 31st at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, there will be a very important all church meeting. Mark your calendars. We invite you to tune in to our weekly virtual programs. The virtual program guide is located on our website homepage under latest news. Newly added to the lineup, Village Chat, Up Ye Mighty Race, Garvey and Reverend Albert B. Clegg Jr. Jeremoji Ababy Ajiman, premiering August 19th at 7 p.m. Eastern. We thank you for your continued support. Have a blessed week and stay safe. 
That concludes our worship service for today. We hope your spirits have been encouraged and your souls fed a daily portion of God's manna. You'll find us right here on this same channel next time, and we hope to see you then. If you would, join me for a prayer of benediction. O oh, gracious Creator, we bring this worship service to a close. We pray all who have ears to hear have heard a message from you. We pray all who came with an open heart have had it filled with a portion of your love. We pray all who came seeking your divine compassion are able to offer others the same. We pray for health, peace, and power in our daily walk with you. We ask this in all prayers in the name of our Christ example, Jesus the Black Messiah. Ashe and Amen. Well, I believe in the power of raising my voice, and I believe in the power of making some noise. Now, if I die, I can't sing, and if I can't sing, I die, so we can sing with one.